Welcome everybody. I am Steve Wilson. I'm Vice President and Principal Analyst at Constellation Research here today to explore one of the hottest emerging areas in digital trust and safety, content moderation. Content moderation at scale, um, content moderation as a service. So as the world becomes more and more digital and seamless, one of the paradoxes is that sovereignty remains really sticky. Online, when it comes to content, nations want to retain control over their own rules. They want to enforce those rules, their safety rules online. So there are huge challenges that we're going to talk to today about cloud and digital management. There is this new solution, new cloud solution emerging, which we are tracking at Constellation, compliance as a service, and new ways to operationalize trust and safety. I'm privileged today to have three experts to talk to Kanti Kapali from Cognizant, Louis Victor de Fransu of Tremo, and my colleague and friend Ray Wong. Greetings, everybody. I'd like you to um, each in turn tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into this space. We could start with you, Kanti. Thank you, Steve, and very excited to be here. Uh, indeed, a very interesting topic and relevant for the time here. Um, so I'm, I'm part of the uh, market leadership team at Cognizant's operations practice with a specific focus on the technology industry. So we work a lot with some of the world's largest technology platform companies as our clients, as well as with some of the most innovative, digital native, born on the internet companies. These companies could span the spectrum across from media to FinTech to InsureTech or gaming and across a variety of domains. Um, I think for the reason that discussion today resonates with us is that uh, for us and for a lot of our clients, ensuring user trust in an online world is a cornerstone for their success. And it's highly dependent on how they are perceived on the single metric, which determines how successful in their, they are in their uh, journey. And as a key strategic partner to a lot of our clients, it's important that we, we play in this domain. We have built capabilities in the trust and safety as we advise and help them with different implementation approaches in this domain. So that's how we, we're in this sector. We're excited to be here and look forward to our conversation today. Thank you. Louis Victor, nice to see you. Very nice to see you. And thanks a lot, Steve, for, for having me uh, today. Um, so I'm the CEO and one of the co-founders of Tremo. Tremo is a trust and safety solution provider that enables and helps online platforms uh, optimize their moderation processes in a way that also streamlines all their compliance obligations. Uh, but maybe before I deep dive into the company, a quick word about myself. Um, I started off my career working in uh, compliance risk management in the financial industry, uh, then did an MBA at INSEAD and then worked for the French government where I was a deputy to the French ambassador for digital affairs. And this role, and in that role, I was uh, working on, I worked specifically on the Christchurch call to action to fight against terrorist content online. I worked a lot on disinformation. And Steve, you spoke about national security. That's one area where national security is at the forefront of some of these discussions. And also worked a lot on the Digital Services Act and, and, and some of the negotiations that happened there. And for me, it became quite clear that there was going to be um, a change in paradigm in the way in which some of these larger platforms, but also the entire market, I'd say, of online platforms, of internet companies, if you can use this term, will need to approach compliance and will need to approach content moderation, no longer as kind of an ad hoc or things you do, but really as the center of their operations and that there was going to be a big need to, to help the industry grow in this area. And that's exactly why we launched Tremo um, two and a half years ago now. Fantastic. Look, I love that perspective. Um, one of the important things, the issues that we're dealing with here is to know whether or not content moderation in the digital medium is fundamentally different from traditional um, control over content. So your perspective, I think, from the regulator side is is super interesting. Um, Ray, tell us a little bit. Um, there, there won't be many uh, audience members who don't know you, but tell us um, how you approach this problem uh, globally. You know, Steve, that's right. And, and I really appreciate the introduction. There, 
the big thing for us is there is no universal set of values. And, and the problem is this need for mass personalization at scale at the country level and individual level uh, has not been easily delivered. It's not something that could be done in software in the past. It required armies of individuals to be able to deliver on those capabilities. And so we took a strong stance early at Constellation Research in investing in digital safety and privacy with Steve as, as our lead analyst leading that charge. And, and here's why our clients they, they need the right balance between community generated content and compliant communications. And this is not an easy act to deliver. I mean, this has been an ongoing struggle to manage, not just from a cost perspective, but also from a proliferation of content types. And so this has led to our clients asking for digital safety and privacy research, understanding what the policies are, and more importantly, figuring out are there technologies to help them to scale and, and deliver that right balance. Wow, we have so much to talk about. Thanks for setting the scene. So we, we started with sovereignty, so let's go there. There are so many uh, geopolitical shifts and cultural sensitivities. We've touched on that. Um, Candy, Cognizant, how, how do you think about trust and safety? And how do you operationalize this? How do you get from the, um, from the deeply personal and, um, and regulatory um, issue of content moderation? And how do you, how do you automate and operationalize trust? <laughs> See, I know it's it's pretty interesting because when we talk about trust and safety operations in, in the digital world, we're almost talking about two parallel access. And, and there is a global policy framework. At the same time, there is a local contextualization. Uh, when we speak about uh, a global policy framework, it touches upon a broad categories of contents, which could be uh, or content abuse, which could be misinformation or copyright infringement or or hate speech or some of the other categories as well. And these, no matter whether you are in, in the Americas or Europe or APAC, broadly, the categories remain the same. And there is a broad policy framework of how you approach those categories. Now, when you balance that with local contextualization, it can take multiple dimensions. It could be uh, a regulatory dimension where, of course, we're speaking about DSA in Europe or the Online Protection Act in the UK and, and so on and so forth. So there is a regulatory aspect of local contextualization, but there's more importantly, there's also the cultural aspect and of how a local population perceives content in their own geography, where someone watching an online video in India may not find it uh, offensive as against to someone watching it in a different part of the geography, let's say in the Europe. So balancing these two frameworks is, is, I think, what is the unique aspect. And at Cognizant, we call this as, as uh, performing operations in a global model. You are global at the same time local, balancing these two things uh, uh, at any given point in time. And this is only possible when we can bring a global scale to the table. Uh, so a presence which is across every region in the world, as well as local to every region. So when you are able to combine that is when you can address these twin access. And I think that's very critical when we talk about trust and safety in today's context and, and in, across the categories and the different uh, domains. So, so I think that's my view on this, Steve. Um, an acronym check, DSA, the Digital Services it's, Act of uh, the EU. Yes. Yeah. Like the GDPR, the Global, um, the General Data Protection Regulation, the, um, the DSA is forming a, um, obviously a very tight, um, heavy regulation in EU, but it's also forming a de facto standard and a way of, um, of thinking about these issues for regulators worldwide. So again, to emphasize that point of counties that, that everybody's doing this differently but we're all part of the same cyberspace so today we're going to focus on content moderation um, as a service it's it's i think it's the, the the kind of leading edge of compliance as a service as a solution category uh, in the old world media content was was a special type of product wasn't it my perspective is that we all needed special equipment and special skills to be able to generate audio and video now that's all been democratized um, Media used to be a bit of a monoculture, and right or wrong, it was self-regulated mostly, self-moderated. 
But now, um, I think you guys shared with me as we were preparing for this that 70% of content on the internet now is user generated. 70%, that to me is just mind blowing. Um, that's the world that gave rise to Trimel. Is that is that right, um, Victor Louis? Tell, tell us more about your um, your your business and and what drove you to do what you do. So for us and 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 when we started launching uh, or thinking about Trimo at the, at the very beginning, we really focused a lot on you know how could we help make the internet a safer place you know as i said before we were working a lot on elements like a terrorist content and disinformation which are two potential harm you know two harms that we see online but at the same time they need and we might speak about about this later they need very different solutions to fight to fight them um and that's that was i think one of the first elements that that drove us uh, as founders of the company the second was this um realization that and you spoke a tiny bit about the Digital Services Act. The Digital Services Act is a real change in paradigm in the way in which companies need to think and address um, risk that their platforms, especially the most, the biggest platforms, what we call the very large online platforms, think about the systemic risk that the use of their service may pose to society. And these two combination really pushed us to say, okay, what can we bring new to the market? And the way we've approached the market is we have a dual offer that are very complementary and enable us to um, better approach the, 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 the solution in a holistic approach. On one side, on the first leg, is an end-to-end -end content moderation platform that enables you to streamline the way in which you moderate from the very beginning, which is we say, what, what are the signals? So what are the detection models? What are the user reports? What are all those elements that signal that potentially your content you may have is bad? to the communication with your users, to the appeals, because we also believe in transparency and we believe that there needs to be a level of appeals. If you remove somebody's content, we think it is right that you enable your user to appeal. And actually beyond, we think it's right, it's also now a legal obligation. We automate your transparency reporting, all of this on a centralized platform that really orchestrates your moderation end to end. On that side, we work with a number of companies um, and I'd say from small to tier two type companies. And on the other side of the business, the second leg is our um, advisory services, where we help some of the largest platforms in the world. Um, I think we work with over six of the VLOPs, very large online platforms, helping them um, conduct inherent risk assessments so they can identify the risks that the services, their, so the use of the services um, pause or could pause if they were abused, but also working with some smaller platforms, helping them redraw their policies, making sure that their policies are optimized and, and, and compliant to some of the regulations in Europe, in the US and elsewhere throughout the world as well. So you're like that safe pair of hands for some of these regulatory complexities that, um, you know, Lord knows no, no single enterprise can really keep up with. That's exactly how we thought about um, our services as we started bringing them on the market. And that's why we brought together uh, diverse team with a lot of uh, specific uh, expertise. Um, Ex-regulators, so we have people who actually wrote some of these regulations in the team, risk managers and compliance experts, but as well as trust and safety experts and, and technologists and developers to really kind of see the full spectrum of how we could help our clients. So obviously, um, you two companies, Cognizant and Trimo, are, um, are, are partners. I'd, I'd like to know a little bit about the backstory. How did you guys come together? Yeah, and it's a very interesting story, Steve. And if at all of all the places, we actually met at an industry conference. And oh, then wow. more often than not, you think that the industry conferences are a good venue for some good food and drink, but uh, we happened to be together at this at this conference in London and uh, both of us sat through each other's sessions and we were like wow I think that's something which is which can actually make our company's service full stack and let me explain when we talk about full stack when we think about technology domain a full stack is is an equivalent to say you could do everything on the spectrum from the front office side to the back office side. So when we think about trust and safety operations, the moment you combine advisory services, operational mm. services, and platform, you have a full stack. And yeah. that 
combining that as a challenge in itself because expecting a company to go full stack is really deep in this industry but if there are two players which can bring components of that and come together it's a pretty interesting partnership so so we get we got started talking on the sidelines of the conference we exchanged some numbers we got together and as we started whiteboarding this I said okay this could be something very really significant so that was the birth of the the idea and i think it's been few months since we were putting together this partnership and going to the market together exactly and we're very excited to see you know our first concrete working together on our first clients in the way that we can you know provide these different services and where our level of expertise differ and complete exactly as you were saying Kanti this full stack offering which is extremely interesting and 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 by what Kanti was saying is also this global approach of cognizant which really helped which you know for us was really a determining factor you know high quality product or delivery with the global scale something that we are very consistent conscious about given the global nature of our clients internet by definition is global all of our companies work globally and so we needed to make sure that we were able to address their needs globally ray you were um, you cover the media um, gl- globally you in the media what what's your perspective um about these sort of seismic shifts that we're undergoing yeah i mean there are a lot of issues going on we got section 230 going on with uh moderation platforms people are playing a role in the, like in the us uh you know there's a balance between free expression and user generated content versus what's inappropriate or what may be seen as sensitive content to different sets of individuals uh and as you can see it's been a wild wild west here uh in america Uh, as we have different sets of regulations and and different sets of incentives here the search based advertising giants uh, have a dominant role uh, in terms of the marketplace and in terms of how policy is being shaped and that works differently uh depending what countries you're in and we've seen other countries push pull back and of course you've seen what's happened in the European Union in terms of you know banding together to actually come to something that represents more of their values uh, and and we're going to see more of that over time right we're seeing a fracturing of the internet we're fracturing of media uh and you know as we get to more micro channels and personalized content people have different expectations on values and conversations and so the content moderation which became armies of individuals as we talked about earlier uh is now being art, you know augmented with artificial intelligence uh and and you know hopefully it gets it right more often than it gets it wrong uh, and then i think those algorithms are getting better over time and by doing that over time it's actually helping uh, to be able to place some level of i would say my perspective of civility because it may not be your perspective of civility and i, I think that's what makes this kind mm-hmm. of a, a very exciting space and a very dynamic space because getting that rightly tuned uh, is the difficulty media has today uh, so a right wing media channel may not want to show left wing views as often and a left wing media channel may not want to show as many views on the right wing as often and and they will adjust those as they need to and a country will adjust those based on their values and a region will also adjust those based on their values and so that mass personalization at scale is what media is struggling with as it deals with its monetization models and ads in search and goods and services and of course memberships and subscriptions. Yeah, I'm hearing all of these things about how do we bring the human um the human touch, human judgment to bear on the interpretation of um content relative to a point in time set of values uh in the audience. It, it, it's fascinating. So let, let's let's look at the safety uh landscape. um from a from a i guess a tech point of view user generated content is enabled by the platforms the very large platforms that we've talking about for um giving people a, a a voice giving them a position that they can broadcast from and there's so many of these platforms that, that you know there's a relatively small number of, of very large platforms but there are so many opportunities and channels for for individuals so that forms you know the, the the global um square that we talk about is really a breeding ground for for threats as well um we we've, we've talked about hate speech already hate speech used to be very ad hoc it used to be a matter of people saying terrible things in comments which are kind of narrow cast but now we've got a, a very real threat of organized terrorist content um flooding these platforms so that scale is incredible um i want to talk whether what what is driving the automation of content moderation is it just scale 
or are there qualitative challenges? Um, Kanti, maybe you can talk to that from the cognizant point of view. Yeah, and and great point. I think I think scale as a dimension itself in content moderation is is very interesting. And and uh, when we look at the scale, uh, we we also come to a very interesting realization. Uh, I think machines or AI can drive a significant level of automation. Uh, but you always also need humans for the nuance. And uh, at the scale at which we are talking about, the answer always lies in the end of how we seamlessly do the handover between an auto moderation, which is a machine driven moderation using AI or some of the traditional techniques and a, how a human overlays on top of that. And that's how effectively we are able to bring about that balance between scale and nuance and do it consistently within the policy and the regulatory framework is important on how we manage this. And, and the scope for error is, is very low within this. And I think everyone operates within the thin margin of error where you get mm. one wrong call. You yep, could yep. be in the media for the wrong reasons. <laughs> while you were starting from the right perspective. So it's a very balanced act between what the machines are trying to help on the auto moderation side versus how the humans are helping it. So I, between the two lies the answer and it's always in the, the end. So that's the view which we take at our end. And it's dynamic. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Go very ahead. and very much so. I mean, completely aligned. And this human in the loop with the AI is so key and is key not only in the moderation judgment itself, but in the entire end to end process, because as trust and safety managers, for example, you want to know, you know, what do your AI models are doing? Where are you getting too many false positives? Where do you not get enough? Where could you improve them? How can you adjust the different thresholds? How do you is there if there's a new threat or you know how hu us humans were very good at adapting. So, you know, if you use one type of language to explain a bad word or, you know, sell an illegal morning that content is detected or automatically detected, um, then people will start using another side. But that means that your AI needs to adapt. That means that you need to have that feedback loop. That can only happen at scale if it's orchestrated correctly, if it's done in a centralized manner that it, with the right KPIs, with the right analysis dashboard, with the right, you know, flows, that enables you to optimize that process. And for us, it's exactly the approach we've taken at Trimo to enable, you know, how to enable the automation, the AI to work with the humans or the other way around, the humans with the AI or however you want to put it and be able to really empower trust and safety to optimize um, your entire process and to better safeguard your users while also protecting their rights of freedom of expression. And that really is, again, this thin balance that we're always Towing with. This is such an interesting area. We, we necessarily get into the topics that you normally don't talk about at polite conversation at, uh, at dinner parties. You know, I was I was brought up. Um, my sense of etiquette was to never talk about politics or um, or religion. But look, we we are just going to touch on politics. In so far as I believe that fifty percent of the world's population is is going to vote in the next eighteen months. Um, and, and indeed, a lot of people have been voting recently. We're seeing fake news um, everywhere, which is the um, one of the greatest challenges, of course, telling, you know, we, we can't believe the evidence of our own eyes and ears anymore. And the, the ability, this is where I think that the internet really is qualitatively different. Um, um, how do you trust, how do you transfer your normal sense of, um, of what's real and what's trustworthy? There's that word again. How do you, um, at, at an individual level, exercise and, and make trust real so um what what are the realistic goals for content moderation you know it's, it's not a magic bullet to fight disinformation so um lv do you have any perspective on on what's a realistic expectation that your clients can have from this sort of solution so uh, this is an extremely important point and the first thing I'd like to say is this, we also need to make sure that with the terminology we use, because fake news can mean a lot of things. And, and, and sometimes we confuse misinformation, disinformation. Um, and I have, you know, 
I, I agree there's a lot of this it could be seen as political but we know today that there is you know and we when I was working in the French Foreign Office we could see the impact of foreign disinformation campaigns external actors try to influence one way or another and and that is that has real life consequences and so it is important that the platforms do what it what they can to protect the users and you know more broadly society of 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 the of, of in which the users live now one of the main challenges around disinformation and around moderating disinformation is that you actually need to stop looking only at the content but you need to look at the actors that are pushing the content you need to look at how the information flows because you'll often um find that in disinformation campaign or you know big disinformation campaign you'll find that they're coordinated so the content itself or the narrative is moving along a specific you know um or it's, you can see it's artificial the growth of the narrative is artificial you can see there's bots behind you can see that there's you know fake content and so a lot of the issue around it is how do you have the right tools not only to say black and white right or this should be removed or this should stay it's no you're no longer in this dichotomy uh, because of course one of the big issues when you fight against disinformation is to not make the problem worse and if you start censoring people or censoring or saying okay this is fake news and so you cut it you're actually putting oil on the fire right you're making this the, the situation much worse than it was before and there's many other methodology and that companies and platforms need to have the tools to be able to do so but you could have warnings you could have label you know labels or you can have you know a label that comes we believe that this or there's evidence that or this fact checker that or community notes you know x has put in place community notes which have shown to work um in 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 a certain number of cases and so there are different ways in which you can reduce the relevance the relevance and the impact of disinformation when using uh this in uh, moderation and in acts of moderation but not just removing the content and this is where we see that you know moderation goes way beyond i need to you know take down this content versus leave this content online and that that itself is a cultural thing you know the old saying that it takes a village to raise a child it, it, that goes to the issue that um the way that we apply morals and values and and bring people up is a community issue so it's fascinating to me that in the digital age some of these community notices to um in a sense make um make good behavior enforcement a bit of a shared responsibility so if your technology is sensitive to that um i think that that's a very powerful tool to bring the human and the tech together uh, ray do you see the the digital services act and and other regulatory interventions um showing a clear way forward yet or is it still early days well it's uh, we actually have one of the world's experts here sitting uh, in our here uh, louis victor <laughs> on the uh, conversation but i'll try to at least make an attempt at answering this question uh, so so dsa focuses on two things from what i can tell and, and one is limiting the public damage so if we're trying to create a misinformation campaign on election or personal damage where someone tries to slander someone uh, from a reputation perspective and so the framework actually allows for you know to take this information activities and look at them and actually figure out a way to you know actually you know figure out can you um actually combat the misinformation by you know reporting it by looking at it by removing the content uh, by dictating uh, you know how you take action on the reporting and the creation of trusted flaggers along the way um it can be, right and what's interesting about the DSA is the fact that it focuses uh, a lot of those regulations on the platforms that have the most impact very large online platforms and very large search engines and i think by doing that you have a framework to at least say you're you are responsible to uh, if you're actually a moderator or mediator in the middle you're responsible for some kind of you know uh, moderation or understanding of what that content is and if someone flags it or reports it or makes an issue of it you have an obligation to go investigate it what it doesn't say is there's no real legal definition of disinformation and i think what's going to happen over time is as humans flag things machines learn from those behaviors we start establishing those patterns and the ai starts coming into play and then you'll see a lot of more power and precision with the uh, DSA. 
And you touched on planning before there. I mean, I just want to make the point that from a security point of view or privacy point of view, um, nothing's perfect. And most regulators know that nothing's perfect. Um, the worst position to be in is to is to not have a plan, to have not thought about some of this stuff in advance. So I like the idea that the professional services aspect of this as well can help a client flush out um, a, a correct methodology that's appropriate for their own local circumstances in their business vertical. But yeah, planning, um, being prepared and being prepared to make mistakes and to learn and to feedback and to, and to do better. Ray's quite right, um, Louis Victor, you, you do have the, the deepest expertise in this area. That's how you formed your company. Yep. Um, what's your perspective on the, on the strength of regulation so far? So the, the DSA has been in, in force for, for a couple of months, a bit more for the very large online platforms. Um, and Ray, what you said is exactly right, right? The DSA does not define what is illegal and what is not. And a lot of the burden is put back on companies. Uh, but what you um, and, and what you were touching upon, which is the obligation for very large online platforms to conduct inherent risk assessments, basically also systemic risk assessments, basically understand what are the risks that they pose to society against an, uh, uh, four types of cr four criteria, including this, you know, uh, risks. It doesn't use the word disinformation, but risks to electoral processes. Obliges the companies to say year after year, okay, we've actually assessed you know, all the risks that the usage of our service and all the features that we provide can pose to this, um, to electoral processes or to uh, the distribution of legal content or to freedom of expression, etc. And of course, if you do a report at the end saying, okay, these are the level of risks that we have, then it, you can next step, logical step, if you're going to submit a report to a regulator and say, okay, and this is the plan that I have to mitigate those risks. And then you do it on year one. And that's audited by a third party auditor. And then year two, you need to do a second one, again, with a plan. And then you can look, okay, this is what we said we were going to do year one. This is what we did. Look, And then the regulators, year after year, are going to be looking. And you saw with the number of requests of, for inf additional information, of investigations launched by the European Commission, that they're not kidding. You know, they're really looking at this. This is a huge priority, you know, in Europe. It's going to become a huge priority in the UK with the Online Safety Act that also has risk assessment obligations around child safety protection and around a number of other uh, obligations. And it's a paradigm that is being followed across the world. You have the Online Harms Act in Canada that's under discussion. And you can see a number of, of, of regions and countries worldwide that are following this shift in paradigm that is moving from an obligation of results, which was, for example, the terrorist content online regulation in Europe, which was you have one hour to remove terrorist content if it's flagged. Right? That's, there's no discussion. You've done it or you haven't done it to an obligation of means. You need to prove that you've put in place all the processes, the tools, the humans, investments to protect your users, to protect society against, you know, spread of illegal content, spend, um, you know, uh, attack against intellectual processes, et cetera, et cetera. So um, cultural sensitivity, we've touched on this before. Um, the, the, the gauge, the measure of what's acceptable varies enormously from place to place and also over time i mean i um uh, maybe i'm getting old but but in my lifetime in in, in the last five or ten years even there's been tremendous um, changes just in australia about um what's acceptable and, and what's normal now i don't want to get into morality or rights or wrongs and i think the really cool thing is that we don't have to because um, the the content moderation as a service the automation and the and the settings um LB that you've been talking about already, um, give us the ability to, to localize those those delicate questions about social norms and what's acceptable. So can you help us understand that some more LB, like, like what options do your clients have to actually fine tune the solution? You know, is there a dashboard? <laughs> yeah. What do you like? Yeah, for sure. And there's multiple dashboards, right? And when we build the solution, we had this knowledge, it would be crazy to think that, you know, uh, Meta should have the same nudity policies than, you know, an adult website. It, of course, they have very different approaches to what is acceptable or not on their platform. And there's multiple ways of doing this. So, first of all, each platform is on, when they use our solution, is free to set up their own policies, to establish their own thresholds with the different detection tools they use, right? And also, 
localize if needed those thresholds. So if in some regions nudity, you know, or, or, or you know, posting a picture of a gun is illegal or um, for, for, for X or Y reason, then you can have a threshold of tolerance for a gun, which is much higher or lower, depending on which region the content is also being posted, etc. So there's a number of ways in which you can fine tune those. Um, and that's really at the discretion of our clients. We give them the tools to do so can help them if they desire, but it's really at the discretion of our clients to establish and to co and to configure the tool to best suit their policies, their approach to what is acceptable on their platform or not. Which is exactly how they wanted. I'm sure that there's been demand for this for a long time. So um, we have talked about AI already inevitably, so let's drill into AI a bit more and the, the, the tremendous sort of systemic risk that it produces about being able to, you know, democratize propaganda. Um, how does how do we deal with that um lv how do we to what degree can we automate content moderation to keep up with with the um the the, the rate of change of um of ai content but again it's a quite it becomes a question of scale right it's a question and and, as you, and you mentioned the cost of generating new content is a significant decrease and so if companies or platforms are not able to manage the sheer volume, they won't be able um, to moderate and to protect their users in the way in which they should. And so it's about making sure that you have, again, the right tools, the right processes um, that are built to be able to scale. And as I mentioned before, not focus again only on the content because it can become extremely hard to detect, for example, in text, what is AI generated, right? It's also about identifying misbehavior patterns of misbehavior of some of the users and then being able to you know bring moderation at another level than just you know the pure content level it's interesting when we talk about ai one of the things is that it's interesting to see how the domains and generative ai have almost developed exclusive to each other uh, they've been on their own individual tracks of course, in the generative AI, as there was this rush of putting the LLM models out there, there was a component of responsible AI within it. But how far the responsible AI uh, converges with the content policies which are uh, under focus on trust and safety. So the, the fact that these two domains now need to converge, which developed in their own silos is pretty interesting. And as they come together, I think there is going to be that greater appreciation a, on the AI side on how does gen responsible AI fit in with the content policies of different geographies and how trust and yep. safety deals with synthetic media. And, and that convergence is, is the focus across some of the focus groups in the industry today on how are these two groups going to come together. And I think as they come together, we'll find some some answers to this very difficult question of how we're going to deal with trust and safety policies. And the, the prospect of a real arms race here, because the, the fundamental assumption, I think, which I, th I want to challenge is that a good AI can stay ahead of a bad AI. Um, now, I don't know whether you want to talk about any trade secrets. I'm sure you don't, but can you give our um, audience a sense of how much AI you're using in your platforms to um, to, to generate the solutions to, to do the automation? Must be a lot of R&D going on. Yes, there, there, there is, uh, but we've also taken a, a very um, neat or new approach to the market. It's where what we work on is bringing these different AI tools together rather than developing our own. Right, we can see today, and I think the latest news was two or three days ago, Roblox just released and open sourced its entire, um, um, open sourced in, its entire um, moderation models for live streaming or voice streaming, it's called voice safety. Um, uh, and this is, uh, you know, big change in the industry. And so we believe that a lot of these AI models will actually be open sourced by a lot of actors in the industry and what we help is we help companies integrate those and optimize and being able to use them rather than trying to develop all our own technology while on our own models when these detection models are moving so fast so um i want to um make a general observation that for, for decades um i've seen a very strong argument from every dimension 
that managed services is is the way through some of these um, qualitative challenges of, of security. Like no business on its own can either have the skills and expertise that potentially can be leveraged by a big managed services company. Um, so, you know, my, my perspective is that the, the technical um, challenge of, of skills to keep up with AI is, is yet another argument for why people need to be really looking for some of the, the scale of some of the big R&D labs and some of the big um, delivery um, functions, the, the teams of people that are keeping up, as you said before, LV, the, um, the regulatory nuance from place to place is shifting all the time. So, you know, that professional services aspect of what Tremo can bring, I think is really critical. Um, uh, I want to talk about, you know, some of the, the description of some of your solutions um, at Cognizant suggests that trust and safety is being operationalized, or at least there's a TNS sort of operation going on. Um, Canty, can you drill into some of that for us as well? Like, what does that look like for a client to operationalize trust? Sounds like a contradiction to me. Sure, sure. And I think when we talk about trust and safety, it's it's such a wide domain and it encompasses mm. almost across the content spectrum that you need some sort of a, a, a framework to think about these services. So the way we think about it cognizant is, is, is you essentially think about two buckets of content and the trust and safety operations related to that. One is when you're dealing with live content or user generated content as it is coming onto the platform's life. Right? And how do you uh, respond to that? And what's your operational framework for that? So that is one bucket. The second bucket is where you are helping to make machines smarter. This is not live content, but you're feeding in data sets to make the auto moderation algorithms smarter. This okay. works in a variety of industry use cases as much as it works on the online domain. It, it has its application wherever you see an LL, LLM model or an auto moderation, there is a data set behind it. And in both of these buckets is where Cognizant comes in, whether we are doing it, let's say, in a passive role, training an algorithm to become smarter and handle content, or we are in an active role where we are moderating live content. There's also another dimension which comes along, like uh, you can think about the trust and safety operations in the categories of the content itself, whether the content is someone posting a comment on a video mm -hmm. or, or a picture versus there is a fraudulent intent. Maybe there is a financial transaction on a particular platform and there is an intent, a malware or a malintention. All of these form different categories within the trust and safety spectrum. So essentially you are creating a matrix between a passive or an active intervention and uh, the other dimension being the different abuse types. And when you get down to defining policy frameworks for each of the boxes within that framework is when the trust and safety operations managed services become so interested that how do you handle each of the use case with what policy framework? How do you enable the people from a training perspective and deliver this at a global scale? So, so the spectrum is quite large. This is still within the content review domain. And around that, you also have the other aspects of content acquisition or content categorization, mm -hmm. which are the peripheral arms of it. But the whole value chain of content and specifically on TNS operations is pretty interesting from a managed services perspective. Yeah, totally different time frames. You've got you've got a slow human time frame in terms of policy and understanding the shifts of content that you're dealing with. And then you've got machine scale, real time generated. How do you jump on that um, in an automated way? The, the other sort of dimension to this, of course, that I've just um, remembered to come back to is the Trust and Safety Foundation. Um, Cognizant has taken, I think, a leadership role in the industry to um to form that new um forum if you like discussion forum is it is it like a meta policy development like do we get um industry leaders to reach some sort of agreement on broad approaches here um can, it's an can you tell us more about that it's an interesting forum uh steve so 
So we've been in the trust and safety uh, domain for like around seven, eight years now. And when we started out, we felt uh, the lack of an industry forum, uh, yeah. either for exchange of knowledge between the industry professionals or just in terms of creating broader awareness. Uh, and, and in somewhere around 2020, we had a couple of industry bodies come up on the scene. One was the Trust and Safety Professionals Association. And second one was the Trust and Safety Foundation Project. Uh, Cognizant made a founding contribution of a couple of million dollars to the Trust and Safety Foundation Project. And this project is tasked with creating a broader societal awareness for the domain of trust and safety uh, through publication of use cases, through multidisciplinary research, through uh, analyzing insights and sharing it with the broader society for, for the society to understand and appreciate this domain, for people to consider this as a viable career option and mm -hmm. for organizations to share some of the broad, uh, best practices. So we, we're proud to be associated with this industry forum and, and be a part of them as much as we also learn from our colleagues across the different uh, companies and platforms on how they are approaching the subject as it continues to evolve. Yeah, well done. I mean, I, I just want to say from my perspective, this is so important and, and so refreshing because the, the security um, industry has, has not normally had that sort of meta culture of, of cooperation and, and social, a social mission, as you say, to make people aware. Gosh, I mean, time's flying. We could talk about this forever. Uh, I, I do want to wrap up. Um, We've touched on AI, on AI already. Uh, the, the, the huge question is, where is this heading um, in, in the medium term, two or three years time? I, I um, wonder what does content moderation look like? Does anybody want to want to um, dare um, wrap up with a bit of a crystal ball about where you think content moderation, what is going to look like in three years time? Is that fair? <laughs> I mean, it's a hard way to look at this, but I would say that it's going to be more automated. It's going to be more personalized. I think we are going to be very good at when we, when and where we insert a human into the process. Uh, yep. and, and I think the other piece is it's going to be in demand. People are going to expect it. And I think those expectations are only going to increase in terms of the level of precision. And so we need to know how many data points or how much data do we need to get to a level of precision that our stakeholders will trust. Yeah, and jumping on this, I think, you know, a lot of the motivation obligations will be driven by regulation. I, I believe, and we spoke about this a few times, and I'm repeating myself, there's so much coming, and we're really at the beginning of a wave, because we see all countries around the world, you know, looking at this. And even when it's not at the federal level, you see states looking at it uh, uh, and independently at some of these areas. Mm -hmm. Of course, AI. AI will enable multiple things. It'll enable more accurate, probably more at, more at scale and more uh, personalized uh, moderation services. Uh, but I also think one of the big things for the future is transparency. Transparency in the way in which you're being moderated, right? Being able to understand why an action or moderation decision was taken on your content. Also, making sure that the companies at the end of the year, or every six months or whenever, publish an transparency report that you as a citizen can understand and understand what is the approach of this or that company. You know, and I think that's really uh, something that's going to be growing a lot. And f um, and maybe the, on the last is we'll probably be moving as the AI grows and as the trans and it's included within also transparency is included within those some of these models as well. You'll start seeing more uh, proactive approach to content moderation, focusing a lot less on the reactive and oh this content has been posted, seen and potentially has had an impact on people, but being able to detect upfront or potentially even being able to say, you know, you're about to put this post, it was removed before, are you sure you still want to post it? Right? And it's going to be moving a lot into that type of direction as well. I think from my perspective, um, for the near term, I think the next couple of years, it's going to be AI will, will drive scale in this domain. Humans will continue to manage nuance. And, and that will be the balance as we eventually get to AGI. And at that point, it becomes interesting to see how nuance, empathy, transparency get embedded within the AI. But in the near future, I think that's the balance between scale and nuance as machines and humans 
work in a balance in this domain? It's um, it's almost like a like a petri dish, like a like a. It's a scientific experiment that we're all in the middle of, and I think the reality of AGI might become most apparent actually in in the area that you guys are working in. So, <laughs> um, I look forward to that. Uh, look, I've learned so much today. Sincere thanks to you, Canty and. Louis Victor for your time and, and thanks to your teams as well for helping put this conversation together. We've been working on this for weeks now and it's it's um it's it's good that the the research and the exposure and the transparency of all of your teams has been fantastic. So that's very valuable to us at Constellation Research. Um, thank you, Ray, for your time today and your perspectives. Uh, everybody keep up the good work and um, I can't wait to see what comes next. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.